He never stayed in one place anymore. Mankind started to move to a place where it was not born. Man becomes a constant mover. What we call between us and among us the wandering Jew, Manitou seems to say something like, really what is happening is, is the wandering non-Jew. Because since that day, nobody feels at home anymore. Man is always on the road. And the Jews on the other side, well, they were obviously on the road as well. For long periods of time, the very fact that they ultimately are staying in the land of Israel, that's the only home in the existential sense of the word. It is the only home because there something happened a long time ago, which was really homely, where something took place, where Jews settled, were thrown out, settled again, thrown out again, constantly trying to get back, while the rest of the world stayed and continued to live in exile. The nations, he says, live in exile. Now that we came home in 1948, we are probably the only ones who can claim that we are at home. That's a radical way of looking to things. And he adds to that another thing. He says, forget not what we read in Parashat Noah, in Genesis, in Bereshit, when we read about the Tower of Babel, what we call in Hebrew the Dor Haflaka, where the nations of the world one day come together or the people come together, you know all the story, a very unusual story and not a very clear story, where one day a kind of society comes about which says to its other, come, and I quote here the Torah, let us build a city and a tower, the Tower of Babel, with its stop into the heavens, and let us make ourselves a name for ourselves, lest we will be dispersed across the world. Man is afraid to be thrown into exile. And what does he do, says Manitou? What he does is, he builds therefore a tower with its peak in heaven, which the rabbis interpret to mean that they want to fight God. Because they want to have a totalitarian kind of society where man is God. Where he runs his own place. And there in that world, he says, human beings lose their own individuality. They lose their own personal approach. They become part of a system. They become a number. As we have seen later in certain countries with communism. In other countries where man was not allowed to speak up and had to go the party line. He says that's ultimate galut. That's ultimate exile. It is an artificial unity. But it is not a real unity. Because if man is not free in his thoughts and he cannot move around the way as he would like to move around, then even when he convinces himself, as we often have seen in history, that he is free, the truth about it is that he is not. And when then God walks in, as you all know, and says, I will break this unity, this artificial unity up, and I will make sure that now, indeed, the nations of the world come about and he breaks them up because people can't speak anymore to each other. Different languages, they break away, they spread around over the whole world and you get the ultimate exile of mankind. And then God sends a man. Just after that story, the first Jew in history, Abraham, Avram Avinu. What is his function? To get things back in order again. If the world lives in exile, has lost its very meaning, does not know the art of living anymore, has fight, is fighting God, wants to create towers for itself, ultimate power, then God brings in one man. One person who converts into the Jewish tradition by creating the Jewish tradition. Abraham is the 
very creator of the Jewish tradition. And he says to Abraham, Abraham, save me this world. Bring in ethics. Make people aware of God, of me. Make them aware they have responsibilities. The world is not a place of half care, we say in Hebrew. It just does not go all. There are reasons why I built that world. And I want you to build that with me, but I need people to help me out. And you are the first one to make yourself available to do so. And then teach your children and your grandchildren to continue that mission. That's Abraham's mission. And Abraham, as you all know, a long story, gets two children. Yishmael and Yitzchak. Whatever the reasons, we shall not go into this now, but things don't go the way as they should go. <laughs> There's a crack in this very ultimate dream. Perhaps, by the way, I won't go into this now and I won't make political statements here, but the crack comes also about because Sarah does not know how to deal with Yishmael and with Hagar. And some of the rabbis, like the Rambam Nachmani, that says that this is the beginning of our great tension with that world out there. We are not completely irresponsible. But then afterwards, when Yitzchak gives birth to Yaakov, again things don't go the way they should go. Because there is also an Esau. And Esau, as you probably know, is indeed seen within the Jewish tradition at least, as the forerunner of the Roman Empire. He is somewhere the forerunner of a world which very much believes in power. And which has done a lot of good, but also a lot of evil. Where empires came about which fought each other, where loads of people paid the price for this. And then something strange happens, some of our philosophers say. Then comes Christianity. It wants somehow to do something about that. It wants to compensate for all what the Romans have done wrong. That's the reason why Paul goes to Rome. To bring some ethics there. Some Jewish ethics. Which is learned from a man, the Jew called Jesu, Jesus. And Christianity borrows from Yaakov. It borrows from the Jewish tradition. In fact, it calls itself the religion of love. But love is a dangerous thing. If you don't know how to handle it and you just let it go, it could become barbaric, as it did. It can create anti-Semitism. It can create hate, because if you don't know where to stop in your love, then it becomes a love which is not natural, and it becomes a love in which name you can do a lot of evil. Yishmael, generation earlier, is the man who obviously inherits from his father, Abraham, this universalistic understanding of the world. Abraham is there to bring God not just to a few Jews and to his children and grandchildren, but he has to bring it to the whole world, to make the world living in exile aware of one thing. There is a God and we have responsibilities towards him and towards each other. And this is a universal principle and is a universal mission, not just for the Jews. And it has been stated that the reason why we see throughout history that Yishmael is constantly working in taking over the world, or at least at certain moments, that has to do with the fact that he has inherited from his father Abraham the universalistic ideas. But when he does not know how to apply them by way of peace, by way of shalom, then he turns it over into the sword. And in that way, it will try to take over the world. But it has its roots in this universalistic, monotheistic idea which runs the wrong direction. 